There you go, we're live. Hi, hi everyone. We are the Blenheim Midwives. So we are one of the community teams in Oxfordshire. We cover about half of Oxford. You will find us up on level seven of the Women's Centre at the John Radcliffe Hospital. We're actually currently looking for a new space. So if anybody's got two rooms available somewhere, please, please let us know. Um, so my name is Maddie. I'm one of the community midwives here. I'm going to be moving to the maternity assessment unit soon, so some of you might see me there. Okay. My name's Antonella. I'm one of the newly qualified midwives that has just joined the team. My name's Sophie. I'm the Blenheim team lead. Um, I'm just going to pause slightly for a second um, to try and get your questions up. Um, can you see any up on the screen? Do you want to have a look for us? Right, I'll kick off. Sorry about that. This is probably not our natural habitat as midwives uh, doing social media live, so please bear with us. Um, we did um, a poll and you wanted to talk about signs of labour, so we'll just give you a little bit of information about signs of labour, um, the stages of labour, and then once we've um, managed to get your questions up, we will um, start answering those. So, um, First of all, the most common way that labour starts is with contractions. So tightenings um, or surges um, that build up. So it might be that you have quite a long build up, early labour or latent phase of labour, where your contractions are irregular. It might be a couple of hours or it might be a day or so. So this, an example of this might be you have one contraction, then a gap for 10 minutes, then two contractions in five minutes, nothing for half an hour and then lots of contractions together so they're irregular um, and not coordinated yet but they're all doing good things to soften your cervix, thin your cervix out um, and get your body ready to go into established labour. Um, if um, this, in this part of labour we encourage you to be at home uh, whichever setting you're choosing to birth your baby in so things that can help you feel more comfortable are things like having a bath um, sometimes people take paracetamol, um, having a massage, going for a walk, watching a film, distracting yourself um, and waiting for things to become established and get closer together. So if it's your first baby, um, once your contractions are three contractions in 10 minutes and they're lasting at least 60 seconds um, and they're strong and they're coordinated and going on like that for an hour or so, um, then potentially that's when you might be in established labour. This is really very much a guide. Um, so every woman is different. Some women have uh, much faster labour, some women have uh, much shorter labour. So if at any point before this magic three contractions in 10 minutes, you feel like you need to talk to a midwife, that's absolutely fine. Please don't be at home waiting for this. Um, if it's your second birth, then it might be when your contractions are every five minutes, because um, often things are a little bit closer. Some women's waters will break first, maybe 10 to 20 percent of women this will happen and for most women their contractions will follow shortly behind uh, in the next 24 to 48 hours. If your waters break, um, put a pad on or if you're not sure if they've broken, put a pad on so um, you can see the colour um, and give, your, um, give us a call. So first of all, the, colour, the colours that are really normal are clear, fluid, slightly pinkish fluid, um, a slightly straw coloured fluid. Um, if it's very heavily blood stained um, or it's slightly greenish, um, then that might be something that we just need to um, look into a little bit further. But either way, if you think your waters have broken, um, then get in touch. So who to call? Um, if you're planning to give birth at home, then call the one in the birth centre. Um, if you're planning to give birth on the spires, you can call spires directly at this point. Or if you're planning to give birth on delivery suite, um, called the maternal assessment unit. Um, any other bits about that, guys? Or have we managed to get questions? We if have not, not quite can... got questions yet. Okay, <laughs> feel free to send in the questions. We'll just keep talking until you do. So, um, I'm going to talk a bit more about the first stage of labour. So, I'm going to talk about when you're kind of four centimetres or more. So, if you're planning on having a home birth, you know you should have the midwives at home at this point. Um, or if you're coming into spires or delivery suites, um, you'll, you'll be admitted when you get to four centimetres 
or you've kind of got those three contractions in 10 minutes. So we've spoken a little bit about those already, um, but that's when the contractions are coming on very regularly. So you're having those three in 10 minutes, they're strong and they're lasting a minute. You won't be able to speak through them, they'll really take your breath away. Um, so gonna move on and chat a bit about how you can cope during those contractions, you know, what things are available um, to help you manage them. Um, so you know, if you're in the hospital, um, out or at home or um, on spires, and um, you'll be able to use paracetamol in the hospital on spires. You can also have um, codeine as well. We've got Entonox, which is available, so that's your gas and air, so that's what you can breathe in. It's a really good form of pain relief, it helps you regulate your breathing. Um, also, if you've got a TENS machine, it's a good time to put your TENS machine on when you're in those, at early labour. That's how you're going to get the most benefit out of your TENS machine. If you're thinking about having a pool birth, it's a nice time to get in the water in the pool. Um, that's really nice and relaxing. Um, you've got lots of uh, room for movement in the pool. Um, in the hospital, we've also got um, a morphine injection, diamorphine, it's an injection that goes into your leg. It doesn't take away all of the pain, but what it will do is it will really knock the edge off of those contractions, um, and it should just help you be able to relax um, for at least a good couple of hours. Um, going up from there, we've also got epidurals available, so that will take away all the pain, it will numb you from sort of the waist below, so you won't feel anything. Um, you might still feel um, some tightenings, but it will take away, take away all of the pain. Should we just pause there, because we have managed to um, see it and see your questions. So hi to people that have said hi. Um, so Isabel asks, um, what do you recommend when, when do you recommend women stop eating during labour, if at all? I'm due to give birth um, around Christmas time, hopefully on the spires, and my big fear is that I would just eat in Christmas lunch before home. <laughs> it is completely fine um, to eat, especially in those early stages of labour. Um, it's a really good idea um, to keep yourself um, hydrated as well, so lots and lots of water. Mm -hmm. Um, we also recommend like isotonic drinks like Lucasade, so bring those in with you. Um, we never tell women that they can't eat. Um, there are some situations, um, for example, if you're on delivery suite, possibly have an epidural cited, um, what that does is that slows down the digestion, um, and we would potentially suggest in those situations that actually eating lots of food potentially wouldn't be too helpful. We do like the stomach to be slightly emptier, and that's just in case for any reason you needed to be transferred into, the, into our theatre, um, your stomach would need to be empty just to keep you as safe as possible. But in early stages of labour, we definitely um, encourage eating little snacks as well is good. And definitely throughout labour, it's important that you have your fuel to be able to keep going. What you don't want to do is stop eating right at the beginning and then just run out of energy right as you're getting into active labour, which will make it harder for you. Yeah. So I would say that most women, um, when they're in really strong labour, don't feel like they want to eat a full meal. So that's where the sort of snacks come in. When all your energy and a lot of your blood flow is diverted to your uterus for your contractions, often digestion slows a little bit. Um, so people tend to feel sick if they eat a lot. Um, not everyone, but often that's the case. So that's why we talk about having little things that you can nibble. Um, bringing them in with you because you might fancy that sort of thing a bit more. If you are going into labour um, and you know that you're not there yet but things are happening, you're expecting to, it to happen in the next day or so, it's really good to have a nice um, sort of healthy meal or something like pasta that gives you some like, long, long going energy um, so that because you might not have a meal later on. Let us know if that uh, answered your question. Um, so another question, uh, is there anything I can do for, oh, for on time labour and board? Maybe you're thinking to get yourself into labour. Um, yeah, so we can talk a little bit about that. Should I talk about that? Or yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, there are things um, that we think might encourage labour, so being quite active, um, going for walks, um, your midwife might talk to you about a sweep, a membrane sweep to try and encourage labour. Um, a lot of the sort of things you hear are maybe not backed up by evidence, but also potentially don't have harms or wives tales. Things like having a spicy curry, um, having sex, um, pineapples. 
Yeah, Lots of foods that are going to like irritate your bowels or get your bowels <laughs> moving as well, like yeah. high fibrous foods as well. And um, some people have said that that's helped get them into the liver. Yeah, so we wouldn't potentially say this is this is shown to have a really significant mm. effect on getting you into labour, but it's you know you've probably heard them before. Um, and then just waiting, trying trying to relax. I know it's not easy when you don't know if when in the next month you're going to have your baby, but most of the time they will make the parents when they're ready. Mm -hmm. um, oh, more questions yeah. coming. We had a question about how long they would last. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we briefly sort of mentioned that the really early stages of labour, um, you know, can last a couple of days, sort of go on and off, um, or, you know, a few hours. Um, and then when you're kind of in, uh, you know, four centimetres onwards, we would say that it's going to, you know, good, good. What we like to see is for first time mums, and um, to move along um, half a centimetre an hour and then you know if you're a second time mum or third or fourth we'd expect it to be at, at least like a centimetre an hour so it just gives you kind of a rough idea of of how long it will take yeah i think we've all had instances where we've been surprised about how little it took or how long we might have taken and ultimately it's all it all depends on the person there isn't a one formula that covers everyone as much as we say that this is what we'd expect yeah um, so, would I be allowed to labour at home for as long as possible rather than having to come straight in? Um, so yes, you can do that um, and it is good to be at home um, for definitely the early part of labour. What I would think about or maybe explore with your midwife um, is having a plan in place for if you decided to stay at home, because that is an option. If I don't know obviously your pregnancy, um, but if you're thinking that you would like to stay at home for quite a long time, you know it might be that actually once labour started, you're more comfortable staying at home. Um, in which case, you can make a plan for deciding that, or make a plan for home birth, and then you can. A lot of people do that. They say maybe home, maybe spires. I'm asking how I feel. So maybe have a chat with your midwife about that because. Um, sometimes it can work really well, but other times that point where you're in really quite strong labour is often a time when people don't want to get in a car um, and travel and come into a new setting and meet new people quite in advanced labour. So definitely there's, yes, you're definitely allowed to do that, but potentially maybe think about um, if it's progressing quite quickly and what your options are. Um, reading the questions um, also uh, not being really not being able to speak during surges I'm worried that my labor won't be taken seriously if I don't sound in pain enough I know family members have been through this even if the contractions are timing right uh, I know the advice will be limiting unnecessary visits where possible due to COVID but unfortunately it's the way if the timing are oh, right will you always be invited in um, yes so completely understand what you're saying it's a tricky time and that's why when i was talking about when to come in in labor and science of labor I talked about it being a guide because um you know it can be really different for different women so when we're assessing you over the phone or talking to you over the phone like you say we're making ultimately an educated guess on what kind of stage of labor you're in so that's why it is really important for you to say what you feel and Hopefully, um, you know, I think midwives here will be listening to you, but, you know, do feel free to say, um, you know, if you feel that you're coping at home and you're quite comfortable and you're relaxed and you don't feel that you need to come in yet, or if you feel, you know, I'm, I'm not managing, or well, I think things are really progressing fast, just be really clear about what you're saying. And um, I think the midwife will respond to that. Um, yeah. Um, do you want to carry on to the next little bit you were going to chat about just while I try and read faster? Yeah, so I um, talk, just talked about a lot of the different types of pain relief, but there's actually lots of other things to do that can help um, relax you and help you um, cope with your contractions or surges. Um, so we briefly mentioned like water, but we've got um, other things that you can do as well, like massage. So if you're finding like you're having a lot of pressure in your back, um, you can always get your partner or ask your midwife to do a little bit of back massage during the contractions. That can be really um, helpful as well. 
Um, we've also got aromatherapy um, in the hospital or if you want to get aromatherapy at home. So things like lavender, that can be really nice. It helps with all contractions, also helps um, relax you as well. Um, we've also got chamomile. We've got lots of different aromatherapies that we can choose. So if there's a, a particular smell or if you want to bring one in yourself, that's absolutely fine. Um, some women um, hypnobirth as well. So if you want to have a little look online at hypnobirthing, and um, that can be really good. It can help do lots of different breathing techniques. So sort of during the contractions or surges and then helps you relax um, following them. Um, there's also like podcasts as well that you can listen to just to help you get in the right kind of headspace. Um, I think we also mentioned a lot about staying well hydrated um, and you know keeping your, your nutrition up as well. Um, so another question here, um, when you say being active is good to help bring on labour and in early labour what's a good balance of walking, being active around the house and resting? Um, so that's a really good question. So I would say um, if it's um, if it's the daytime and things are happening, then that's a good time to go for a walk. Um, balancing that with eating, resting, relaxing. Um, if it's night time and things are starting and you can sleep um, or rest, I would prioritise that at night time because if potentially if you're in early labour over one night, it might be that you're up all the next day and potentially the next night um having your baby so just to try and um you know rest as much as possible i definitely say if it's night time um, and you can prioritize sleeping and then at that point where you can't lie down anymore or you can't rest anymore then try and mobilize maybe if you get a gym ball um or can do kneeling leaning over um, the sofa something like that some of those positions can often help really discomfort Anything you wanted to add to that? Or... No, no. Um, so, hi there, I'm uh, wanting to get an epidural for my labour and I'm concerned about arriving too late and missing the chance to have one. What are the signs I'm looking for to know when to phone once the contractions start to make sure I receive an epidural? Yeah, so I think we've sort of, you know, mentioned about when to call us and when you're getting those three contractions um, in 10 minutes, that's, that's a really good time to give us a phone call. And obviously, you know, if you're not sure you're a bit worried before, then it's absolutely fine to give us a call. Um, when you when you come in to sort of have that, that assessment to see, you know, whereabouts in labour you are, um, it's a good time to mention that, you know, you're thinking about having an epidural. Um, we never say that women can't have an epidural. Um, what we would say, if potentially you were fully dilated, um, we might suggest that you might you might just want to start pushing instead of having an epidural. Um, and that's just because sometimes you can have a baby before your epidural starts working, and then you have a baby and, and numb legs. Yeah. Um, but we never say that it's too late, but it will always be a conversation with you, with the midwife. Um, and something else to consider as well is sometimes it does depend on the availability of the anaesthetist. So that's the doctor who would, who would put your epidural in. Um, so it's always worth letting the drives know um, as soon as possible um, that you'd like an epidural. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. A lot of women are worried about it being too late for them to have an epidural. And there's not a point in labour where it is um, not possible to give you an epidural. The situation that often is um, people are talking about is if you're, say it takes maybe 15, 20 minutes to put an epidural in uh, and then maybe another 15, 20 minutes for it to start working if you're going to have your baby in the next 10 minutes potentially it's not going to be possible for you to get the relief from that epidural and also at that stage it's probably going to be quite difficult for the users to actually put it in um, but not for everyone you know i have seen people have epidurals very very late in their labor so like maddie said um it is definitely not a rule or a hard one to know it's just something and that's like you know if we can see the top of your baby's head, it, you know, it's not going to be possible to get in. You're not going to get the benefit of, pain, of the pain relief at that stage. I understand your questions about getting it in time um, and the sort of guide that we've given you is, is what we would recommend. Um, so we've sort of had a little bit of a chat about positions that's really good um, in early labour. Um, but we can also talk about good positions when you're sort of in the, in the swings, in the full-blown labour. Um, so, you know, we like to help women stay as active as possible, so moving around, walking, standing up. 
and um, we've got lots of different things, lots of pieces of equipment as well in the, in the hospital and I've got inspires. Um, so we've got lots of birth boards, we've got lots of mats if you want to do some kneeling, you can do some kneeling on the bed. If you want to spend some time just having a bit of a, a, a rest, a bit of a relax on bed as well, we can sort of um, help you move on your right side or your left side. Again, these are all really good positions to be in. And um, we've got posters as well in many of the rooms to sort of give you a few ideas. If you're struggling or you feel a bit uncomfortable, then just speak to your midwife and she'll help you move into a new position. And um, you can also kind of like hang off of your partner as well. You can use them for supports. Yeah, and that, um, so another question. Um, at which week would you start to encourage induction? Um, how long can a woman refuse and see if it comes naturally? So what I say to um, all of the women that I see in clinic is, you know, we can't make you have an induction. An induction is something that we, we can offer to you, we can make recommendations about, but ultimately it's it's your choice. Um, for women who we say are, are low risk, so there's been nothing in their pregnancy that they've needed to see the doctors about. Um, we usually recommend it's 42 weeks. We suggest that women don't go any further than 42 weeks. And that's just because we know from the evidence that we've got that the placenta doesn't function, it doesn't work as well after this point. So that's why we always offer all women an induction of 42 weeks. For other women, there might be um, other suggestions that doctors will have made plans in place to just induce slightly earlier on. So if you've got anything called gestational diabetes, um, Think reasons like that, but that will always be discussed with your midwife and your doctors when we suggest earlier earlier on. Yeah. So we really um, want to try and move away from women feeling like they have to refuse mm -hmm. things, um, and really want you to start um, feeling like you're you're the you're the main person, obviously mm -hmm. the most important person in your pregnancy and labour, and we're there to support you, and give you information um, for you to make decisions about your care. So. Um, hopefully when we're talking to you about induction, we're giving you the reasons um, it might be recommended and also alternatives. So some women that might choose not to be induced but continue um, pregnant, we might offer them additional monitoring. Um, so sometimes scans, sometimes um, um, continuous monitoring of your baby's heart rate for a period of time. These aren't all absolute indicators um, of, of what you should do. and, and those things, but um, it's a different plan if you decide um, that you don't want to induce. So um, please talk to your midwife about that, and um, she might suggest that you speak to one of the obstetricians or one of the consultant midwives, um, and just make sure you've got all the information before you make your decision. Um, but as a midwife, we're here to support you whatever your decision is. Um, right, more questions. Um, so. Am I able to take anyone with me at hospital during my labour or do I have to be on my own? Oh. <laughs> so we have now opened the Plenty Assessment Unit to partners to, for women that are being assessed in labour, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, that is yeah. right. Yes. So if you're coming to delivery suite um, and you're coming in in, um, in labour to be assessed, your partner will be able to come in with you while you're being assessed. Unfortunately, we do not have um, we don't have the space on the spires, but that could still be the case on the spires. So if you are wanting to give birth on the spires, it's likely that will ask that your partner waits in the car um, or waits downstairs while you're being assessed, and then we'll be able to come up um, after that assessment. Yeah. But at the moment, even during labour, you're allowed one person um, to be your birthing partner. We would never kind of try and cheat that your birthing partner away from you if you weren't well when you are in labour yeah. and you're labouring and. Um, Things do change quite a lot um, in this pandemic, so we, at the end of this session, we'll just double check um, that that is the case um, and in which areas this applies to. So we'll ask the employees just to post an update on, on that, but um, I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm 37 plus two weeks, and since last night I've had back pain. Is this a sign of early labour? It, it could be, but it could also be something called pelvic girdle pain. Um, if the back pain is kind of coming and going, that could be an early sign of contractions, could be how you might be experiencing contractions, could be your baby's head moving down into your pelvis. Um, but equally, it's not uncommon to have pelvic pain in late pregnancy. 
Yeah. yeah, we don't know really. Is the and answer. It, um, if it's something that you're struggling with, um, call your local community team or get in touch with your midwife, and she'll hopefully just be able to give you a little bit more advice that's kind of specific to you. Yeah. So, um, like I said, with so much stuff in labour, um, we're making educated guesses about a lot of things. So it definitely could be the beginnings of labour, or it could be a number of other things. So if it's um, something that's bothering you, like I said, give me a call, and she can go through your specific pregnancy and things you've been experiencing with you. Um, can you take paracetamol or other over-the-counter pain relief in early labour? Yes. <laughs> the short answer is yes. Um, paracetamol, we know that it, it's safe during pregnancy, so you can take it. Um, and we normally advise that you do take it during early labour, which is when it might be able to take that edge off off of your contractions um, and that would be just normal dose that you take when you wouldn't be pregnant so we'd expect that you take you know one gram of paracetamol if you weigh more than 50 kilograms yeah. with most other over-the-counter medication we don't recommend it, it tends to be just that one um, like ibuprofen and dipenic we don't recommend in pregnancy um, occasionally some of the codeines are prescribed um, but again mm -hmm. speak to your midwife or your GP um, about those um, so uh, I missed the first couple of minutes. Um, first, uh, first pregnancy, I'm 36 weeks. I'm a bit worried about the travel distance from home to the JR. I live 30, 40 minutes away with no traffic. Would I need to call sooner in the early stages? Mm -hmm. Well, I would probably say so. Once you start experiencing those three contractions in 10 minutes, that's that's still a good time to give us a call. That will give you plenty of time um, to come in if you're invited in. Usually you say to them, once those contractions are three and ten, you could give yourself another hour or so at least at home just to give your body, body the best chance. And the other thing um, with all this advice is we're just scanning your questions and giving sort of general advice. So um, we don't know if, for example, you've had um, children before or if you've had very fast labours before or anything about that. So without knowing a little bit more about you, that would be our general advice. But again... Um, say, for example, you, it was your second labour and you had a really quick birth before, then it might be that it, it's appropriate to call a bit sooner. And like we said, if it is your second birth, especially if you had a vaginal birth, um, probably it'd be better to call when the contractions are more like every five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, just scanning up, I think we've asked, yeah. answered all the ones so far. Do you want okay. to go to the yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, as Maddy was saying, you've done the early labour, you've done the first stage, now you're starting to feel a bit more like, you know, I want to go home, I don't want to do this anymore. It's what we call the transition stage. It tends to be between 7, 8 centimetres and 10 centimetres, and that's the stage where you feel the contractions are the most powerful and you feel that this is this might be too much for you. Um, and quite often we have this ladies at this point that say, no, I, I'm going to go home. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and that, as midwives, we think that was a fairly good sign. <laughs> um, we try and give you as much as support as we can, because we know you can do this, and this is as part of labour that's physiological and that we'd expect. Um, and then following this, you might start to feel the urge to push. It might start off just at the height of the contractions. And we generally say, if you can continue to breathe through your contractions, you should do so. Um, because it will then become a really un, an urge that you really can't re repress, really. It's called the fetal ejection reflex, and it just makes it that you have to push. You can't stop it. Um, it's a very physiological thing, so we kind of encourage you to listen to your body and just go with what your body's telling you that you should be doing. During So now we're starting to enter into the second stage, um, and during this time, Obviously, we'll try and get you to push according to what your body's feeling. Sometimes if you have an epidural and you're not feeling that urge, urge to push, we might be telling you when to push, or we might be giving you a bit more time before you start pushing, even if you do feel that slight pressure and that urge to push, um, just to try and get baby as low as possible. So we'll try and, we would intervene if it was a time for us to intervene. If you had lovely natural labor um, and you are already feeling that urge to push, we wouldn't intervene unless we had a, an issue. Yeah. 
Um, and during this time, we'd also encourage you to <laughs> adopt different positions. I think this is a theme that's coming out here. Yeah. Um, and we might say that, you know, you might want to go onto your all fours, you might want to go onto your knees, you might want to go onto your left or your right to try and encourage all of that movement of baby's head. Um, and we'll probably be listening much more if you don't have a continuous monitor on, we're listening in after every contraction, or if you do have the monitor on, we'll be kind of looking at it much more often to make sure your baby's okay. Um, and then it'll get to the stage where your baby's head is almost there, where we can see the head and it's advancing really nicely. If this is your first baby, it might advance a bit and then start to come back in a little bit, and then it just keeps advancing more every time you push um, until it will kind of retreat back up. Um, and then will come the crowning, which is what we call when your baby's head starts to come out. Um, and that's when most ladies tell us about that stinging, burning sensation um, during this time. This is also the time when midwives might be telling you to try and do small, steady pushes instead of that big push um, to try and allow your perineum to stretch and reduce your risk of tearing. So it's very important that you listen to your midwife at this time. Um, yeah, <laughs> shall I jump in with a question? Sure. Thank you. Um, so, um, Isabella says, um, if you arrive at hospital and you're not in established labour after mm -hmm. an examination, what happens then? Do you always get sent home or can you wait in the unit or on the ward? We, so it's made with, um, as part of the discussion with you about what you want, we usually encourage that women go home. And that is because that we know that the safest place and the best place for you um, to carry on with labour, embrace labour, is at home. And that's just because you feel much more comfortable at home, you feel safer at home, and we've got lots of space at home that you can do um, all of the things that we've suggested. Um, you could have a bath, some more paracetamol, um, have your snacks at home, um, and yeah, just try and relax as much as possible and just encourage labour to keep coming. Um, so... Yeah, we most of the time encourage people to go home, but also if people feel that they absolutely can't and they need more support, we try and take that into account as well. So sometimes um, people do go to the board. Um, so definitely if you're feeling this, then have a conversation with your midwife, but most of the time you'll go home. Um, but it is possible to stay in specific circumstances. So yeah. Um, the other thing is, if it's, if it's daytime and not raining, you know, you might want to, as mad as it sounds, um, go for a walk around the hospital grounds, go and get a drink. It, you know, it dep depending on the situation, if you're not quite there yet, or if you want to see either things are going to pick up or slow down, then that can be an option. Maybe not at sort of two or three in the morning, but sometimes in the day, that, that can be something that women find a good um, compromise. Um, so, in a low-risk pregnancy, when will you be offered a membrane sweep and what's involved? So, at, at the moment, because of the COVID pathway, we're offering membrane sweeps at 41 weeks, um, at your 41 week appointment, when we'll be discussing with you, um, perhaps booking you in for an induction or any other, other alternatives. So, a membrane sweep, essentially what it is, is we, it's a vaginal examination, so we'll have sterile gloves on and do a vaginal examination and then we try and locate your cervix and see whether it's open at all. If it's closed then there isn't much, much we can do but if it is open then we're able to actually try and stretch the cervix and which is the stretch bar of the stretch and sweep and then try and bring our, hand, our fingers around to try and separate the membranes of your waters from the cervix, which can sometimes release um, some hormones that cause your cervix to soften um, and hopefully bring labour on. There are a few risks to it, as always, whenever you introduce anything, um, down below there's a slight risk of infection, but if your waters are intact, then that risk is severely um, reduced. And then there's also the risk that while we're down there, your waters might break. It's Unlikely, but it is one of the risks, and then you be going down the um, broken waters route with calling the therapy assessment unit and um, going from there. Yeah, um, sometimes um, we will offer it um, earlier than that. So, say for example, your um, 
you're going ahead with an induction um, around your due date for another reason, um, then it might be appropriate that a little bit before then that we offer you a suite. Um, so yeah, the sort of after your due date to 41 weeks more for if everything's straightforward and you're potentially waiting until at least 42 weeks. Um, so Nicola's asked, are you familiar with the Amiball device for preventing tears and can you recommend it? Um, so I don't know much about this one. Um, I know a bit more about the Epino, which is a similar kind of thing. Um, all I would say is I don't, I haven't seen um, large, good quality studies that show that it works. Um, but anecdotally, I've had a lot of women report really positive um, results. So basically, it's a device to. Um, practice um, stretching your perineum in the later stages of pregnancy so that when you're in labour the perineum is already stretched a little bit and less likely to tear. Um, we could potentially use something else and, and apply it to that. So um, one thing I'm talking to women about is perineal massage. And um, so the idea is, is similar but instead of using a device, you're using fingers in your hands with a little bit of oil or lubricant to try and uh, massage and stretch out the perineum uh, regularly, so you know once a day um, in the last sort of six weeks of your pregnancy. Um, so that has been shown to reduce tears, um, sort of significant tears for women having their first baby. So potentially, it's as it's using a similar kind of principle. You could think it works, but I haven't seen any evidence of it other than quite really quite actually positive positive anecdotal evidence. Um, so yeah, that's it. part two. Oh, sure. Um, just checking for any more questions. Um, I think that's it. I'm just scrolling back. So if we then go back to kind of the second stage and pushing, we've talked about crowning. Another, we do have a little bit of a package of care that we offer you while you're in second stage to try and reduce the amount of tearing you have. So your midwife might suggest that you have a warm compress, um, which is essentially either a warm pad or a, a warm flannel that we put onto your perineum to help um, soften that area and help stretch it as your baby comes. Um, to try and reduce the tearing and obviously your midwife will ask you before she does it um, and you're free to say yes or no but we do suggest that that is something that um, that you have and then your baby will be born um, and we try and deliver babies straight onto you so that they have nice and skin skin um, and we try and do delay core cramping as routine always at natural births and at cesarean sections now um, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, if you're not familiar with the term delayed cord clamping, it's just where we um, where we leave the cord attached to the baby before we clamp and cut, um, and sort of give a minute up to ten minutes, kind of even longer sometimes, depending on what the situation is and what and what you want. And um, what that will do is it give all the blood or the oxygen to baby, and um, it gives them like an extra third of their blood volume. And um, so it's a really lovely thing to do. Um, yeah, and um, talking about the delivery of the placenta, so that's when we're sort of moving on into that into that third stage. And um, so have a think. So there's there's two things that we can do. We can either have a um, physiological third stage where we leave the placenta to come out by itself, so your body will naturally go back into those kind of urges, those contractions, surges, and um, the, the placenta by itself. Um, or we can um, do what we call active third stage, where it's where we give you an injection and um, to help encourage your placenta to come. Um, it's always made in a, with a decision with you, as with everything. So sometimes your midwife um, might suggest that it would be beneficial to you to have an injection. And that's just to help deliver the placenta a little bit more quickly and reduce your risk of bleeding. Um, so, I've got a couple more questions through. Um, so, I'm already classed as high risk, as a high risk pregnancy, not being talked about being induced. Uh, as I've already had some problems at my next appointment, can I request to be induced? Um, thanks, Lisa, for this question. 
It's really difficult without knowing about you and your pregnancy and um, what the factors are that mean that potentially there's some high risk in your pregnancy to give an answer to this. Um, so it, but it's obviously something you're thinking about and um, experiencing the problems, although I'm not sure what they are. So um, at your next appointment, I'd definitely encourage you to discuss this with your midwife or doctor and um, explore with them the benefits and um, risks of being induced um, or not. And if it's something that we can offer um, or if it's something that we really don't think is um, beneficial. Um, so sorry that that's a bit general and a bit wishy-washy, but I don't think it's um, able to answer it uh, any more specifically without much more information. Um, so Tracy said, will a caesarean will my partner be in the theatre with me? That's an easy one. Yes, they will. Only really rare situations um, if they need to be put to sleep for your caesarean to encourage partners not to be there. Um, um, Nicholas asked um, again, would that be practicing perineal massage from 34 weeks then? Um, so I think officially the guidance maybe says 35, 36 weeks. Um, what is difficult is you obviously don't know when you're going to go into labour. So you, some women um, will, it will be quite normal for them to go into labour at 37 weeks and some people might be pregnant for another five weeks after that. Um, so a, around um, 34, 35, 36 weeks is, is a good time to start. Um, the main thing about this is um, the regularity of you doing it. So doing perineal massage or using one of the devices we talked about once or twice is probably not going to have an impact on reducing your chance of tearing, whereas doing something regularly over a period of a few weeks is probably going to have much more of an impact. Um, do we need to bring in flannels and towels if coming to hospital? No, yeah. we will supply all of that stuff for you, so you don't have to worry about bringing anything like that in. Yeah. Unless you particularly want a towel or something of yours to have afterwards or during. Um, but yeah, definitely. I don't think we don't actually. We, don't, we just got quite little towels, so if you're thinking afterwards for your nice shower afterwards, yeah. might you want to bring in your own towel from home? Yeah. I don't think we've actually got flannel, so if you did particularly want a flannel, it might be worth bringing that in. But we've got lots of like swamps and paper towels yeah. and things we can. We can use instead. Yep. Yeah. Um, any other questions or anything? If anyone wants to tie in the next like five ten minutes, that we can just give you some more information on. Oh, one more. Um, my placenta did not come out by itself after my first labour. It had to be surgically removed. How likely is this happen again? Um. Unfortunately, we don't actually know like any specific um, evidence or like percentages off the top of my head. What we do say is is each baby's very different, um, so hopefully it won't happen again. There's lots of little tips and tricks we can do to try and help get your placenta um, out, which they probably did last time. So, and another thing we suggest this time is that you have an active third stage from the beginning. Obviously, we don't know what happened in your last pregnancy. Um, in your last labour, but we would suggest that you have the injection um, from the get-go once your baby's delivered and try and get the placenta out that way. Um, and again, sometimes there isn't an identifiable reason that your placenta was retained, but sometimes it might be something um, that is more likely to reoccur again. So again, um, worth having a discussion with your midwife or if it was that you gave birth at this hospital, she can essentially access your notes to see um, if there was a cause or if there might not be. So you've probably got a slightly higher chance of it happening again, but certainly um, not necessarily that it will. Um, and just making your care providers aware is helpful for us um, to try and reduce the chance of that happening again. Um, I think we're coming to an end. Yeah, so send in any last questions really quickly because we've pretty much covered first, second, third, and fourth stage of labour. Yeah. Um, so all of the contact numbers um, should be at the front of your blue note. So if you're calling Spires or if you're calling um, Wallingford because you're planning a home birth, um, or you're 
call in return assessment unit, then um, those others should all be on the inside covering the front of your base. Um, I've got a couple of last, okay, few more. <laughs> <laughs> We thought we were escaping them, wouldn't it? Um, is it possible to have water birth on delivery suite? Yes, we have got one room um, with a pool on delivery suites. Quite a lot of the women that we recommend to be on delivery suite um, for one reason or another aren't actually suitable, so this room's usually free. Um, but it, when you come in, if you let us know as soon as possible that you want to use the pool, um, then we'll make sure that it's available for you. If it's not available straight away, we'll offer you one of our other rooms, and then if it becomes available, um, we'll let you know. We'll get it clean as quickly as possible so that you can you can use the pool. Um, the only other thing to add about that is, I would, um, as there is only one pool on delivery suite, we find um, reservists for women that want to use the pool um, that have that have been recommended to have their baby on delivery suite. So if you're someone that has a straightforward pregnancy and want to use the pool, um, it is really quite common for the pool to be used on spires. So potentially just have a think about if spires with a pool is more appropriate or delivery to with a pool if you've got some risk factors. Um, we've also got um, new telemetry machines which mean that we can have more, um, that your baby can be continuously monitored using wireless waterproof machines that hopefully this gives more women the opportunity to use the pool but also have their baby monitored continuously. Um, Thank you, Lucy. Lucy has just got back to us. Um, we weren't sure at the beginning um, if it was the same um, that partners were allowed to come in for assessments as well as elective labour, and it is. So it's the same across the board if you're at home, if you're spires or other birth centres or delivery suite. If you're coming in to be assessed um, because you think you're in labour, then your partner can come in and you don't have to wait in the car. Thank you, Lucy. Sorry. Um, Um, okay. Uh, at what stage of labour is a C-section offered if required? It can happen at many different stages in labour and for lots of different reasons. So that would be something that's um, discussed with you if it's you know thought that actually the best thing for you and the best thing for baby would be to have um, delivery via cesarean section. So that's something that will be discussed with you um, at the time. Yeah. It's important to know if your baby's really low or we can see the top of baby's head Sometimes doing an instrumental delivery, such as a forceps or a vacuum, might be more appropriate um, than a cesarean section where we need to get baby out the other way. Um, again, just lots of people saying thank you to Lucy um, before we um, for clarifying the right information, uh, which makes sense because we should be giving everybody the same opportunities no matter where they choose to have their baby. So thank you again for that. Um, so, I think that's it. So, thank you for listening to us. I'm yeah, thank you so us. much. We've not done this before, and um, we were a bit nervous, so hopefully, we <laughs> managed to answer your questions without fudging it too much. Um, and maybe we'll see you again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.